60 years ago, on January the 11th, 1963, the Beatles released their second single. It was the one which would kickstart their incredible run of chart success in the UK, and is perhaps the most important single of their career. In this video, we'll look in detail at the song's recording, dig deep into the record's sound quality, and take a forensic look at the original UK pressings. We'll also find out why such a game-changing record has become so overlooked in their catalogue, and why it's impossible to buy the original 45 mix today. I'm Andrew from Parlogram, and welcome to the story of the Please Please Me single. Please Please Me is today one of the most overlooked and underrated songs in the entire Beatles catalogue. Apple has, via the recent remixes of Sgt Pepper, The White Album, Abbey Road, Let It Be and Revolver, squarely focused the attention of today's audience on the second half of their career. And a cursory look at any of those best Beatles songs or album rankings online shows that Please Please Me comes very low down on many of those lists. Please Please Me had been written in a few hours solely by John. At that stage, the song had a kind of bluesy Roy Orbison type vibe, which although George Martin thought showed promise, suggested John take away and speed up. When they all reconvened at Abbey Road one week later to re-record Love Me Do and P.S. I Love You with session musician Andy White on drums, they managed to squeeze in a recording of the reworked, sped up version of Please Please Me. Thankfully, that September 11th performance with Andy White on drums survives, and you can hear it on Anthology One. By the next time the Beatles and George Martin met on November the 16th, the dynamic appeared to have shifted. At the meeting, the Beatles put their foot down and refused to let Martin issue How Do You Do It as their next single. Instead, they wanted Ringo back on drums and insisted Please Please Me be their next single. It was agreed, and 10 days later, on Monday, November the 26th, the Beatles arrived at Abbey Road, all set to record Please Please Me and its B-side, Ask Me Why. They arrived at the studio at 6pm for an hour-long rehearsal, before kicking off the three-hour session with 18 takes, including overdubs, of Please Please Me. And it was at that point that George Martin made his famous proclamation over the studio talkback, announcing... Gentlemen, you've just made your first number one record. Although the song was in the can, it needed tidying up, but that editing and mixing work was left for another day, and after a break, they turned their attention to recording Ask Me Why. Ask Me Why was one of the songs that had originally been recorded at their debut Parlophone session on June the 4th. Written by John, heavily influenced by Smokey Robinson, it was the most complex of the group's songs to date and was one which showcased John's ability and craftsmanship as a songwriter. The next day, the Beatles met their new publisher Dick James for the first time, and George Martin played him Please Please Me. James was very impressed by what he heard, and immediately went to work arranging bookings for the Beatles on TV and radio. One of the first bookings he secured for them was on the ABC weekend TV show Thank Your Lucky Stars. The show went out nationwide on Saturday, January the 19th, and attracted a great deal of attention. Although not on the scale of the Ed Sullivan appearance, it turned out to be a bit of a watershed moment for them in the UK, as everyone suddenly began talking about the Beatles. Their appearance on that show led directly to bookings with promoter Arthur Howes, who put them on tour with Helen Shapiro, Tommy Rowe, Chris Montez and Roy Orbison, and the rest, as they say, is history. Please Please Me, backed with Ask Me Why, was released as Parlophone 45 R4983 on January the 11th, 1963. EMI's promotion for Love Me Do had been virtually non-existent. In fact, this ad for it in the magazine Pop Weekly was paid for by Brian Epstein himself. That ad, along with other cuttings from Pop Weekly from this period, were preserved by a dedicated fan in this amazing scrapbook. Pop Weekly had been launched in September 1962 and was run by staunch Elvis fan Albert Hand and a young Australian impresario named Robert Stigwood. Its ad manager, by the way, was Sean O'Mahony, who would very soon become the publisher of the Beatles monthly magazine, 
where he was known as Johnny Dean. Although certain parallels could be drawn between Stigwood and Epstein, they had very different ways of working. For a start, Stigwood wasn't interested in promoting groups, and perhaps more importantly, didn't have Epstein's class. An event at around this time which illustrates that was when a meeting was arranged between Stigwood and the Beatles. But at the last moment, the Beatles were told that Stigwood was too busy to meet them. That brush-off turned out to be a major error on Stigwood's part, when four years later, he fancied himself as the successor to the NEMS organization after Brian Epstein's death. However, the Beatles, remembering his attitude towards them, flatly refused to work with him. Although the pictures in Pop Weekly were excellent, the writing was terrible. Lots of cod American DJ speak and embarrassing cliches, and its review of the Please Please Me single was at best confusing. The boys sing gustily and drive a hard instrumental bargain in a composition I find uninteresting, but the power behind the whole thing could save the day. Also, presumably because they wore suits, the magazine on more than one occasion bizarrely compared the Beatles to fellow Parlophone artists The Temperance Seven, a briefly successful novelty band consisting of ex-Chelsea art school students who went around pretending it was 1904. Now, it won't have escaped anyone's notice who owns this album that Please Please Me isn't on it. And that's a real shame, especially because it did reach number one on the New Musical Express, Melody Maker, and even the Pop Weekly charts. Unfortunately, none of those was the chart that actually counted. That was on the record retailer chart, which subsequently went on to become the official UK singles chart, where it only got to number two. But the success of the record in the UK did nothing to help the singles cause in the US. As he had done with Love Me Do and countless other British records of the time, head of international a and at Capitol Records, Dave Dexter Jr., decided to pass on it, allowing it to fall into the hands of the small independent Chicago label VJ. Released on February 7, 1963, VJ 498 became the first American record to bear the Beatles' name or should I say Beatles, where it ended up selling just 5,650 copies that year. Capital must have been kicking themselves a little harder when VJ re-released the record on January the 3rd, 1964. They also replaced Ask Me Why with From Me To You, which helped the single to number three on the Billboard Hot 100. Whilst those misspelt copies of the VJ single are some of the rarest US Beatles records, the rarest UK pressing of the Please Please Me single is without doubt the red and white Parlophone demo. Just a few hundred of these were pressed and would have been sent to TV, radio and other media outlets just prior to the single's official release date, usually in a special top pop promotional sleeve. Stock UK first pressings carried the same red and silver Parlophone label as Love Me Do, but not for long. At the time of Please Please Me's release, each company within the EMI group of labels had its own distinctive coloured label design for their 45s. HMV was turquoise, Columbia was green, Capital was purple, and Parlophone was red. In mid-January 1963, in what was basically a cost-cutting exercise, EMI ditched those colourful designs and replaced them all with plain black ones. Released two weeks after Please Please Me on January the 25th, Parlophone 45 R4989, Saturday Night at the Duck Pond by the Cougars, became the first Parlophone release to bear the new black and silver design. All copies of Please Please Me pressed after this date had black labels too, which for the time being still included a 45 prefix in the catalogue number. This was eventually dropped from all EMI labels from March the 8th, 1963. By the end of 1963, most Beatles fans owned Please Please Me in one form or another, whether it was the single, the album, or the Beatles hits EP, which had been released that September. So naturally, the demand for the single was fairly low the following year. And these post-January 1964 pressings, with their sold-in-UK text across the labels, are the rarest and hardest to find of all the UK pressings. By the way, contrary to popular opinion that the Beatles singles were always available, Please Please Me, along with Love Me Do, From Me To You, 
Can't Buy Me Love, I Feel Fine and Paperback Writer were in fact all deleted from the EMI catalogue in June 1967. Another small detail on Beatles records I'm often asked about are the two letters printed either side of the centre hole. They appear not just on 45s, but on the albums too. These letters indicated the rate of purchase tax that was due on that particular record. Purchase tax was introduced by the UK government after the Second World War and was levied at various rates on luxury items, of which records were one. And the rate of tax was indicated by those two letters. So, for example, the MT code came into force on January 1st, 1963, before being replaced by the ubiquitous KT code in July of that year. And whereas Love Me Do can be found with at least six different codes, UK first pressings of Please Please Me should only bear the MT code. These two letter codes are visible on nearly all copies of Beatles pressings up to 1973, when purchase tax was replaced by value added tax, VAT. First pressings were housed in these multicoloured wavy sleeves, which had been in use since 1959, but were phased out with the changeover to the black label. These first issue green parlophone covers had an error on the reverse, where the word industries was misprinted as instruments. This was quickly redacted and corrected. Now values on all of the above depend mainly on condition and of course demand. But do me a favour, please don't write to me asking me to value individual pieces. If you want to find out what something is worth, it's best to search completed items on eBay or take a look at poppsych.com. If you want to sell something and you're not sure of the value of it, take some good quality photos or scans of it and list it on eBay as an auction. Little of value gets overlooked there and it will find its true value, most likely in the last few seconds. If you'd like to go further into the weeds about all aspects of the Beatles UK singles, I recommend seeking out this new book called Made in the UK. It's exactly what it says on the cover, a complete overview of the Beatles singles manufactured in the UK. This weighty tome has 668 pages containing more than 2,700 photos and scans of labels, sleeves, promotional items, original sheet music, advertisements, reviews, acetates, and more, and shows every UK manufactured Beatles single released from the 60s up to the present day, and all in great detail. Not only that, it covers export singles, CD and cassette singles, and box sets too. It's published by Appcore Books on January the 18th this year. I'll put a link where you can order it from in the description. But hurry, it's a limited edition of 500 only. Now one thing all these original UK single pressings of Please Please Me have in common is that they all sound amazing. Way better than on any mono pressings of the Please Please Me album, first pressing and 2014 included. And there's a good reason for that. In the late 1950s and early 1960s, pop music was almost exclusively recorded and consumed in mono, and Please Please Me and Ask Me Why were no different. Most recordings made at that time at Abbey Road were recorded simultaneously on two separate tape machines. One in twin track, which separated the vocals and instrumental channels, and the other in straight mono. Now, apart from the familiar fader controls, EMI's custom red desks had the ability to mix a third channel output besides the two being sent to a stereo tape machine. Recordings made via this mono output were known as delta recordings, a kind of on-the-fly mono mix, if you like. The twin track recording served more as a safety recording, which if necessary, could be made into a stereo mix if required at a later date. Recording Delta Mono direct to tape was a process used for most pop acts around that time. Although George Martin's great rival, Nori Paramore over at Columbia, had access to four track recording well before him. For the time being, Martin and his engineers had to be content with making stereo mixes from the twin track recording until he finally got his hands on the four track in late 1963. Now, doing a live mono mix saved both time and a tape generation, 
and as it was still a mono world back then, Delta was in most cases considered the master. On November the 30th, 1963, four days after Please Please Me had been recorded, the Abbey Road engineers pieced everything together from the session to make the mono single master. Later on, on February the 25th to be exact, Please Please Me and Ask Me Why were, along with all the other tracks on the album, mixed again with added compression and reverb, but this time using the twin track tape as their source. Now, as many of you know, a dedicated mono channel, in this case the Delta Mono recording, will produce a different sounding mono mix than one made by folding or mixing the twin track output into one channel, which is why the 45 mix sounds so different to the album. It's certainly a generation higher than the version on the LP, and to my ears, sounds stronger, clearer and more alive on this. But it's on Ask Me Why, where the difference between the Delta Mono and the Twin Track mixes is the clearest. So here's the challenge. Can you tell the difference between the Delta Mono mix on this 45 and the version on the album? Well, here's a clue. It's all down to the level of echo or reverb. Now, of course, I can't play you the entire song, but I may be able to get away with playing you a tiny snippet during which you'll hopefully be able to hear the difference between the two mixes. The moment in question comes just after John sings the word misery towards the end of the song. I'll play the clips back to back and add a caption so you know which is which. Ready? Misery. Misery. So, did you hear a difference? The first sample, recorded directly off the original 45, was much drier, i.e. it had less echo than the second sample, which was recorded from a copy of the 2014 Mono LP. So how can you get to hear the Delta Mono mixes on this 45? Well, for a start, you can forget YouTube or any online streaming service, because they're not on there. In fact, you can't hear it on any digital release. The only way to really experience it is on some original vinyl. Now, there's no need to spend big money on a fancy red label original. Any standard 1960s black label copy will suffice. This 1976 pressing may be a reissue with its Dash 2 recuts, but it's a great sounding disc, with slightly less limiting than the original, but more importantly, it contains that dry Delta Mono mix. In fact, it was used on all UK 45s up until 1982, including the one in the box set from that year. Now, I'm a big fan of the 2019 singles box, but they dropped the ball as far as this single goes, because the version on it is the twin track remix from the LP and not the original 45 mix. The Beatles hit CP on vinyl and CD also used the album version. However, not owning the CD or cassette singles, I can't tell you which mix are on them. So if you have them to hand, drop us a line in the comments. Although the US VJ and Oldies 45s use the same Delta Mono mixes, the compression they added at the cutting stage pretty much kills any of the sound quality of those mixes. For me, Please Please Me is a much stronger and more important song than both its predecessor, Love Me Do, and its follow-up, From Me To You. It was truly the record which broke the Beatles nationally in the UK. But what's the future for the original single mix? Well, I'm sure the original Delta tape of Ask Me Why at least must still exist somewhere at Abbey Road. All it needs is a little more in-depth tape research. Then we'll all be happy, right? I really hope you enjoyed this video and I'll see you next time for some more Beatles stories. But it's all over for this one, so I'll say bye for now and thanks for watching.